you tell me a little bit about what it was like when you first got to Austin, what the film community was like here? Yeah, 1983 I got here, they were still showing a lot of movies on campus. A ton of movies. That's one of the reasons I moved to Austin. To, you know, they were showing on a weekday night, there might be four to six films showing on the UT campus. I could go to the various, I wasn't in school, but I lived near campus, so I could see a lot of movies. But then I, I noticed that they were showing the same things over for classes. A lot of the same titles started popping up. But it was, it was pretty exciting. But there wasn't really, there was hardly any production. There was like a film school, but there weren't really a lot of features being made or anything. When, uh... About one a year, you'd hear of a film being made locally. Really? Is that, that infrequently? Yeah. And you always knew about it. It's like, oh, someone's, some, someone had scraped together a couple hundred thousand dollars and making a Super 16 feature? Wow. Usually it was a genre. A lot of horror films. I think the legacy of Texas Chainsaw Massacre, you know, looms in, in Austin, particularly throughout the 70s and in, well into the 80s. That was, if, if you're going to make a film, it better be a genre thing you can sell. You know, no one was making, like, an art film or anything. When... Uh, video stores first started popping up, just in general. What, what did that do for people who like just kind of film buffs? How did that change how they watch the movies? Yeah, it was a total like consciousness shift for the film buff. You know, like younger people just don't understand. Like you knew of films, but they were just these mysteries. You had heard about it, but it wasn't accessible. You had to wait for it to come around, you know, or show it again at a revival house. Maybe look through the TV guide, might show it two in the morning as filler on some station, the growing more and more TV stations throughout the 80s. So when videos came, it was really a revelation. It's like, oh, well, this is going to put theaters out of business. But it was so exciting to have, you could see everything. But it didn't work that way. You could see popular movies. The trickle down, it took a long time before they really started bringing more interesting fare, you know. You were a big fan of like experimental stuff back then, right? Yeah. What is, what's the importance of having those kinds of things readily available for people to watch? Yeah, well, we're in an interesting place that there is so much is available. You really can look it up and find it. But there was something I think the Film Society started because, you know, we wanted to see all these films and yet they weren't available. But it was kind of fun getting an audience to experience them together. But I don't know. You know, it, it's cool that everything's available, not, and it's still not true. There's so much that isn't available, let's not kid ourselves. But there's so much that is. I tried to buy a copy of Star 80 and it was $80 on Amazon. A DVD uh, of it? Yeah, rare. It yeah. was never a big earner, so those things get tougher and tougher to find. Um, but yeah, if you were going to get experimental work, you know, good luck. Yeah. Certain documentaries, certain, a, lot of, a lot of the indie features of the 70s and 80s, they weren't commercial enough then to make it to video. It wasn't anyone's financial interest, so then it never is. They, they missed the boat. Do you have any specific memories of uh, going to the Isle of Video specifically? Um, sure. What do, I would, what, do you, what do you think of? Yeah, I mean, uh, to be honest, I lived kind of near Vulcan Video. Okay, cool. So, that works too. Yeah, yeah. I, was a, I was more of a Vulcan Video guy. It was down the street. I would walk there every night. And it was a fun time because I could pretty much, go, I would go to every movie that was out. It's great when you're not, you know, basically you're not employed and you're not, <laughs> you're not in school. You could actually watch three or four movies. I would watch three or four movies a day in the theaters and then watch something at midnight in my house or whatever people I was around. We oh, let's watch that again. But it was fun to get movies and watch them again and again. So uh, I did a lot of, a lot of Vulcan, but uh, yeah, I love video too. Um, if they didn't have a title, you know, you'd end up over there, uh, which I isn't watched, that far, you know. It was like, yeah, it's right down the street, yeah, right? Yeah. I watched uh, what's it, Inning by Inning, mm. really, and uh, there's this quote in there from Augie that uh, we were talking about how people were kind of discouraging him from becoming a coach at first, and yeah. he said, well, if I'm the best at it, there's going to be a place for me. Right. Do you think that holds true with... with uh, like businesses also? I do too. I think in the right community, in a unique community like Austin or San Francisco, a literate community, I think if you are the best, if you're the best bookstore, if you're the best, you know, that you, there really is enough kind of loyal customers who actually could, would show up, who enjoy what we all do like about like a video store. 
perusing the new release shelf, seeing, seeing what's available. You know, we like shopping, you know? Reading the, you know, online, you can't necessarily re read that much. Or see the recommends, you know, all the things we like about bookstores, we also like about video stores. And so it's really in the people, the spirit of the place, the people, that's what kind of keeps you there. So I think in Austin, yeah, we're lucky that, you know, I Love Video has been one of those places where you kind of, you feel good, you know, walking in there. Has a history spirit of it, but you know, it's hard, like economic factors are just, they're huge, you know, so.